Robert, does this look about right? A formula for rockets. Now, we're, we're completely improvising this because, as I said, Robert was supposed to come on after this talk, so he's going to be a little bit nervous because he didn't have time to prepare and do his power poses and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, Robert, you sent us a little bit of a bio on how to introduce you. I got that from the organizing team and deleted it immediately. Great. Because, um, you know, they're usually full of big, boring words and, and read a bit like a LinkedIn profile. <laughs> um, so what I do is I scroll through your social media, and these guys know the joke already, and I look for something that I thought, that would be really interesting to share. <laughs> oh, it, shit. <laughs> yeah, you, you see that look of nervousness? As you know, I'm not here to embarrass you. I'm also not here to blow your story. You're capable of doing that. <laughs> um, apart from working for or, or having is perhaps a better word, companies with bizarre names like Wakupa, which is where we first met, and Karma. I think you're going to hear a little bit about that. I guess so. Um, we actually have something in common, and you probably don't realize this. You posted a photo uh, a week or maybe three ago that says, this is my new job. <laughs> yeah. I am yeah. now a tour guide. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I am now a, the managing director of TQ, which yep. is an actual building. And now I have to actually show people what that building is like and how we're going to help startups in those spaces. And yeah, so, so we're tour guides. So you probably true. don't know this about me because we, <laughs> we haven't connected since you got back. But I have a building like that in Groningen we opened in September. Cool. And I, I, know, know, yeah. I know the pain of <laughs> doing those tours. Everybody wants to come along and then the vet hunter wants to come and yeah. then it's the... Uh, economic Zark and says, oh, can we bring a few people? Will you show us around and share your vision yeah, in, exactly in like, a yeah. building that looks like chaos and ruins and construction? <laughs> and you're like, really? Those things take up an immense amount of time. My recommendation to you is just hire somebody to do the tour guide stuff because it never gets better. I like this idea. We should talk about this more. All right. yeah, Ladies absolutely. and gentlemen, he's here to uh, give you a formula for building rockets or something like that. Or growth. Oh, it's growth. It's not more <laughs> Okay, well, you can figure that out. Uh, please, you know the tradition. What we want is all those people out in the back of the room to look in this direction and ask, what am I missing? Please, a campus party warm welcome of applause. Shouting, cheering, clapping, whistling, you name it. Give it all for Mr. Robert Kral. Wow. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me. I'm going to be talking about a formula for exponential rockets, no growth. Um, just to give you a short rundown of why I get to talk to you people. Um, I started out when I was 20 years old with my first company, Wakupa. Um, that was a market research uh, provider. We helped market researchers with their uh, tools. That eventually got acquired by GFK. Then I moved to New York, started this company, uh, Karma, in Techstars, an incubator just like Rockstar. Um, and uh, Google came along and said, hey, why don't you come work for us on this new project? Um, I've recently moved back to the Netherlands to become the managing director of TQ. As I said, it's a, a, a space where we help startups achieve exponential growth using the right talent, tools, and training. It's in the heart of Amsterdam, and we'll be launching in September. So uh, if you feel like it, shoot me an email. My email address is at the end of this presentation, and I'd love to give you a, a tour uh, as much as I can. I'm going to be talking today about constraints. Constraints are the things that hold you back, right? Constraints are the things that you really can't do because you don't have the money, you don't have the time, you don't have the resources. It's really something that is very like you know, common in a, in a small company or when you're just starting out with your career, you're really bummed with all these constraints that you have. Um, so how people look at it is that constraints are the opposite of exponential growth. With exponential growth, I mean growing not 1x or 2x, but 10x. So growing 10 times as big or as successful as you are right now. What people don't realize, though, is that constraints are actually what uh, gives exponential growth. They are what, uh, um, they're not the opposite. They are helping you to achieve what you want to achieve. I'll tell you a little bit of a story on how that, how that works. So basically, with my first company, Wakupa, me and my CTO were building our first platform. And we had a bunch of users, and it was really great. But at one point, my CTO came up on a Friday and said, I'm going to be here all weekend. You have to go out, buy a new server. I'm going to install this server. And this is the only way this website is going to stay on the air, like it's going to stay online. Because it, we're totally swamped. This one server isn't cutting it anymore. Um, and I looked in our bank account, and there were, I think, like minus 200 euros in it. So I had to tell him, yeah, sorry, uh, Wouter, my co-founder, uh, you can't uh, get this extra server because we have no money. 
why don't you figure out how to optimize the code, make it more efficient, and then we can just run off of this one server. So, you know, at first he gave me shit for it, and then we basically lived with our constraints, lived with the constraints that we had no money to buy this additional server. So, went uh, and worked throughout the weekend. You know, I started as an engineer as well, so I tried to help out. And at on a Monday, we looked at the code base, and all of a sudden we realized, hey, we built something way more efficient. And in fact, when we look back at it uh, right now, the next three months, we didn't need an additional server. We had made something, and we had optimized it. We had made it even so that we could introduce new features along the way. So this constraint that we have, this money constraint in this case, uh, provided us with additional creativity. We made something um, that you know was more efficient, um, and it allowed us to grow even faster in the future because it was a more efficient code base. We can introduce new features. There was room for uh, for growth. We had made that room. And so, if you look at going from that constraint of not having the resources you want to exponentially growing, I think there's two things we need to be talking about. The first one is excellence of how things are truly excellent and the second one is how you distribute that so let me let me tell you what i mean with that let's start with uh, the excellence part right so um you start with something and you use it you use a product and sometimes you really really absolutely love the product it does something really magical something really delightful that is an excellent product if it helps you achieve a task, that maybe is a good product. If it gets you close to completing a task, yeah, that's okay. You know, they tried. But it can also be bad and it can be even like very terrible. And excellent is what you need to achieve for. You not you don't get a good product by trying to uh, aim at, at be making a good product. You uh, achieve a good product by by aiming for excellence. So how do you get towards building something excellent, right? Well, I think it starts with the talent that you work with, whether it's your employee, whether it's your co-founder, uh, whether it's a partner that you work with, an outside partner, or even an investor. You have to create a culture of talent and a, a, a culture where the talent can really thrive in. And that starts with stop thinking about these people as their jobs. So there's a, a certain task that anyone has in a team, a, a, a platform that they work on. You can, for instance, be an Android engineer. You work on an Android platform. Or you can be uh, a sales manager. You work in sales. And it's really easy to say, we have a sales team, we have an Android team, we have an iOS team, a web team, a backend team, a frontend team. But what is better is to think about these people as projects that you're trying to achieve, things that you're trying to achieve uh, exponential growth with. So you, know, you could say, for instance, that onboarding of new customers, making sure that new customers are happy with your product, that that is a project. Or you could say, well, retention is a project. I want to retain customers that while I have them signed up, that they are actually still active a few months from now. And this is a fundamental change that even Google, when I worked there, had to go through. We had to think less about there are engineers and there are designers and there are data scientists. Let's break those barriers down and think about projects. What are we trying to achieve together and deliver on those projects together and be responsible for them together? with the product manager ultimately running that project. So if you do that, you can not really do that and not have conflict. But the way I think you can resolve conflict is by remembering this sentence from Paul Sappho. Strong opinions are to be weakly held. So what does that mean? If you have a strong opinion, if you're passionate about something, that's fine. You can argue, you can be super passionate about something uh, and even maybe you know shout a little bit. That's fine with me. But as soon as we hear a better solution, and that uh, solution has been uh, tested and tried and, and proven to be correct, you should let go of that opinion. An opinion is nothing, right? It is something that you, that you think is right. And if something is validated, you should step off. You should let it go. And if you find that this becomes your, you know, if you make this your mantra, mantra of the team, then you'll find that you'll be less emotionally attached to your ultimate solution. And this is a really great way to work with, uh, with talent, to keep talent motivated and to keep them passionate as well. But as long as they hold their opinions weakly, as long as you're able uh, to accept change and accept reality. 
So another way of looking at excellence is that you can't really make excellence products before you know how they operate in, real in the real world. And one way of doing that is through prototyping. And this is something that at Google became increasingly important over the time I worked there as well. Um, there are great tools to achieve prototyping, uh, especially a, a, a Dutch company called Framer. It allows you to quickly prototype a mobile app or an online uh, or a site. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a great way of, of validating what you have in your mind with your end user, because that's also always what you should be doing. There's even this um, kind of method of doing this uh, in, in one week. Who here knows about the Google Design Sprints? Oh, this is great. Two people, three people? Yeah, all right, great. Um, so the Google Design Sprints are uh, a method for you to, in a week, prototype what uh, you have in your head and see if it actually works. So on the first day, you try and understand what problem you're trying to solve with your prototype. What are, you, what are we doing here? What is really bad about our product and what can we make better? And then on the second day, you diverge. Everyone in separate groups tries and fix that problem with uni uh, unique I and, uh, and innovative ideas. And then on the third day, you try and decide what idea should I work on? What is the right approach to tackle this problem? On the fourth day, uh, day you try and prototype this uh, problem. Uh, you could do it using keynotes, you could use Framer, as I said, you could use some uh, even like sketches, whatever gets the job done. And on the fifth day, you're going to show that prototype to real actual users. It makes sense that if you uh, start this sprint, that on the first day, you already recruit these users so that you know in your heart, like, I better make something good. I'm going to show this to real people. Um, you know, and then after uh, you show it to these real people, you kind of say, was this worth the effort? Are we now going to take this prototype? Have our uh, ideas been validated? Have our opinions been validated? And can we actually do something with it? Um, so if you want to learn more about this, go to gp.com slash sprint. Uh, there's a great book uh, coming out by Jay Knapp, uh, Design Sprints, I think it's called. And it's, it's, really, it's really great. It's really fantastic. So another way to look at excellent products is not just having this mindset of, we need to build. That was my first startup, uh, was, oh, isn't it great to build stuff? Oh, we finally have a startup. I can wake up whenever I want. I can go to bed whenever I want. Like, there's no manager. I can build whatever I like. But as long as you don't actually measure the result of it, you're just stroking your ego. Um, and the way to do this, to uh, figure out what do I need to measure within my company or with my product or with my team is to also apply this, this learning from Google Ventures, which is called the HART framework. HART stands for happiness, engagement, adoption, retention, and task success. Um, and for each of these kind of uh, uh, elements of, of, of measuring your, your success, you can you know, put this in this grid behind me. Um, you can think about, for instance, happiness. What is the goal uh, on achieving ultimate happiness in my product? Well, that's for instance, let's say that I'm a photo sharing app. I want to have moments where people share a photo and that photo is actually uh, viewed and uh, they then share a photo back. That is probably a good happiness indicator that they're happy with my product. Or maybe it's a survey that you do at the end of, um, at the end of their uh, onboarding. Like, how happy are you with this product on a scale of one to five? Signals for that could be that people share actually more photos and that there are more uh, links happening in between users. And then a, a special metric about this is that, well, uh, I should have 90% uh, of my users should rate it uh, uh, with a five star. And you could do this for each of these uh, metric categories, right? And it's a really great exercise to kind of come up with what is ultimately your hero metric. A hero metric is the one metric that your whole team should know you're trying to improve. So if someone is working on improving uh, your product and it doesn't help this hero metric, this one single metric that's going to make you a hero, yeah, then, then drop it. Then, you know, stop thinking about this issue. It's not important right now. And so, you know, there's a bunch of ways you can think about it. Let's say that you're, uh, you have a site or an app that allows you to rent a car online. Your hero metric might be that, okay, I want to get people to post uh, uh, as many cars as they can. So at the end of the, uh, the month, I want to have 40% of people that signed up uh, post uh, uh, listing for their car. But if you turn it around and if you look more at, okay, we need to actually uh, think of the other side of the marketplace, we need every user to at least rent one car a week. That is a totally different objective that you have. And if you don't 
talk about uh, this with your team if you don't discuss what is our goal right now for this month, for this period, for this quarter, you're going to have an issue. That is really what separates a good product from an excellent product, I think, is having clear metrics. Another way to measure yourself, to measure the uh, success of your product, is called OKRs. Who here knows who OKR, what OKRs are? Great. Okay, so OKRs are a method uh, invented at Intel, I, th I believe, and uh, very much practiced at Google for uh, saying what are your objectives and key results, OKRs. Um, so lem let's just show you what this looks like. Um, this is the OKR for a PR manager at Blogger. Uh, you're all familiar with Blogger, I hope. Great product. Um, this is a, uh, a quarterly OKR sheet that they would make. And you would rate each individual action that you take on a scale of 0 to 1.0. Um, you first rate the objective, which is a big goal. So in uh, this case, uh, this person says that they want to improve bloggers' reputation. And they're going to do that with a few key results. They're going to do that with a list of about like five to six key results. So for instance, um, they have uh, established uh, bloggers leadership by speaking at three industry events. Now let's say that they only spoke at two industry events. This rating would be instead of a 1.0, it would probably be uh, a 0.6 or a 0.7. The object of the game is not to always hit 1.0. The object of the game is to hit between 0.5 and 0.7. If you hit 1.0, then you've not overachieved enough. Then you've maybe, you could have aimed a little higher in your uh, results. If you score 0.5 and below, then you maybe have to look at like, can I actually achieve these things? Or uh, did I practice enough? What kept me from achieving this goal? Uh, so this is a really neat exercise that we use at Google. The CEO uses it, the VP uses it, the product manager uses it, the engineer, the intern. It's a really great way also to make, transparent, uh, to make it transparent for other people. What am I doing this quarter? Well, this is the results I want to hit. This is, if you can help me with that, come talk to me. If not, come talk to me next quarter. So it's a really great way of keeping each other in the loop. I think a really interesting way of looking at this as well is, is, is making sure that you have your priorities straight. And you do that through, I believe, three things. Data, demand, and delight. Looking at it through these three dimensions. So if you put that in a chart, it kind of looks like this. First, you have data. You need proven data that something works for it to be prioritized uh, in your roadmap. Then you need to look at the demand, right? Like wha who is demanding that this feature go live? Is it customers? Is it my boss? Is it uh, our investor? What is the demand like? And then finally, you can look at this, which is you know, ultimately the most subjective way, is is it really delightful? Is it really like, you know, does it give me an emotional connection to this product? And what you'll notice is that over time, as you develop a feature, and you can really clearly prioritize it, it's usually because they have two of these. So you can, for instance, have something that has a lot of data to prove that it uh, needs to be done. You have a lot of demand from outside uh, uh, users that you know this is really important to them, but it doesn't really feel delightful. Maybe that's okay. If it only, however, has one, like you know, uh, we just think this is really delightful, but there's not really a lot of data to support it, and maybe you know demand is not high for it. Uh, you should think about it if this is really a priority that you wanna you know that you wanna take on. Um, and if you have all three, then congratulations, you have an absolute unicorn in your product. You have a unicorn uh, priority, and I can tell you right now that it doesn't exist. I have never worked on a feature that has all three. Um, if you have all three, one of those is probably wrong. One of those you've uh, overestimated. Uh, uh, so try and think of this if you, you know, build this company or if you build a product, uh, if you work in a larger organization and you have to prioritize anything, does it fit in these three-dimensional ways? It does it, is there any, any way of how I can explain this priority to others? So we talked about excellence, now we're going to talk about something else. This is what the usual slide deck uh, looks like that uh, startups pitch with, but there's one thing missing. What is it? It is distribution, yes, correct. So the main uh, uh, types of slide decks I see always talk about 
well, we're a great team, we have this product, we have a solution, we have a market, we're gonna make a billion, uh, we just need uh, 200K, and that's the good slide decks, right? That's the good uh, presentations that I see from startup founders. But what they always seem to forget is how do I get it in the hands of users? What is my distribution uh, strategy? How do I do marketing? Is it really just PR? Because PR is, is great, and you can definitely master it, but it can't be your only distribution channel. So you have to think about this when you pitch your company or pitch your product to someone. What I think in terms of distribution works really well if you have a channel that is inherent to the product, that is baked into the product, that gives you automatic distribution just as people use the product. So I'll give you an example for that. My last company, Karma, uh, based out of New York, was a mobile provider. We had a small uh, uh, Wi-Fi hotspot that you put in your pocket, gave your Wi-Fi wi all across the U.S., and anywhere you uh, went, it, it you know showed that Wi-Fi signal. You could connect to it. You could use it yourself. But other people also see that Wi-Fi signal, right? That is inherent to a Wi-Fi signal is that other people see it, not just you. And so what we thought would work well is that we made that into a channel, a distribution channel to acquire new users. And so what we did is if, if you connected to this hotspot and you weren't the owner, you were shown uh, this, uh, this little page that said, hey, this is Karma, we're really uh, great. If you wanna use this Wi-Fi, just click here and you're in. However, if you want to uh, have this Wi-Fi on you as well, just go to our website and buy it. And it was so successful that Sprint, our carrier partner, came up to us and said, we have a big problem. You guys have more users than you have devices. And we're like, that's not a problem. That's, that's exactly what we wanted it to be. Um, uh, providers are really used that you have your device and there's a phone plan on it and that's it. But we had all these users uh, kind of using Wi-Fi signals that were just, you know, out and about. And it, it was a really great way to, uh, to the yeah, to acquire customers. Another way of thinking about distribution is to look at stress. How long do I still have? Is it, uh, yeah, we're good? All right. So stress is the one thing, the one channel where if you can find something that is very stressful, you can really benefit from that. So what, what I mean by that is uh, stress is a situation where you're, Urgency is really high, but the chance of success is really, really low. Uh, this is a method also used by the Google search team, for instance. When I was at Google, they used this study where they asked people, what are you doing? What kind of actions are you doing every day? And how stressful are these actions? And then they put those on, a, on certain axes in a, in a chart where they looked at things with really high urgency but really low success rates. And then said, okay, these are areas where we can improve, but these are areas where if we improve, we can get a certain amount of traction because people are passionate for it. It's stressful for someone. So I always love working on, on issues and ideas where the stress is the highest. So try and find your distribution in those moments. When are people the most stressful? And is that maybe the exact uh, uh, time where I can hook onto them and help them uh, uh, relieve their stress? Habits are also a great way of looking at distribution. How can I, when I have someone, uh, when I've acquired a user, how can I retain that user? How can I make it, uh, my product a habit, right? Because this is kind of like the, the ultimate thing that you want. You want your product to be an absolute habit. And one way of looking at that is through Nir Eyal's hook model. The hook model essentially ascribes this, uh, this, this kind of loop of how you get sucked into a product. Um, you can al also call this the IKEA model, because IKEA uh, has this hook to it that's, that's very similar. First, you uh, are approached by IKEA or you have this, uh, this need for uh, a desk, and you go to the IKEA website and you think, yeah, this cabinet might work, but I'm going to go to the store uh, first. So I take this action from a trigger, from uh, seeing the IKEA brand or seeing an IKEA cupboard at someone's house or whatever, an external trigger. And then you go to the store. You actually take action and you go in there. As you move through IKEA, you see variable rewards. You see very specific things that kind of like reward you for being there. For instance, here's a coupon, here's a sale, uh, here's a really good uh, uh, like you know hot dog sandwich. Uh, there's there's all these things to keep you inside of the store. And ultimately, you have walked through the entire building so much that you feel invested. Yeah, I can't just go home now. I took a car here, I've been here for two hours, I ate a fucking hot dog, like I need to like, you know, buy something here, right? And they keep you in the store. It's, they even, it's like, it's built like a casino. It's so incredibly uh, confusing to get out that you're, you know, you're invested. And then ultimately 
you buy your, uh, your little cupboard and you go home and you start assembling it. And that is also your investment. You have invested time into this cupboard. This cupboard is your cupboard. You have made this. This is really great, right? Um, so then uh, the next time you, um, you think about buying something, you're like, well, you know, I have one IKEA cupboard already. And, like it was really great. I built it. It felt good. Now I'm going to do it again. And this applies to uh, a lot of things. This applies to Pinterest as well. For instance, if you in Pinterest pin your first photo, uh, Pinterest tells you, okay, that's great. You now have your first pin. But if you do it more, we might feature your pins. Or if you uh, make uh, your own little uh, board, then we might feature that board. So there's variable reward to it, and that's really crucial, is that you, when a user does something, you reward them uh, for the amount of effort that they've uh, spent on it. And when I have made this Pinterest board, when I've made this Pinterest board with all my furniture in it, that cupboard, this rug, et cetera, um, then I am invested. Then I can't just go to a Google image search and say, well, I'll just find it here, right? No, I'm going to go back to Pinterest. That's where my selection is. So to kind of wrap this up, what you need to be thinking about for exponential growth is you need to be thinking about 5 to 7% growth every week. This is kind of my standard. If a startup isn't achieving this, they need to push harder. They need to do what it takes to achieve this. This is, by the way, not my uh, invention. It's taken from uh, Y Combinator. Uh, when you're in Y Combinator, you're expected to grow an average of 5 to 7% weekly. Uh, you can count this any way you want. You can uh, do it on the basis of uh, daily active users. You can do it on the basis of revenue. Just pick something and try and uh, achieve that 5 to 7% growth weekly. Because what you don't want to be uh, doing is you don't want to go for that 1x change. Because, you know, in case you have noticed, doing something times 1x is actually just the same thing. It's a little different maybe. Like you've taken your product, you've added all these features, but it hasn't really multiplied. No, what you should be thinking about is 10x growth. So to sum this up, uh, this is basically my formula for growth. Exponential growth is a combination of doing things in an excellent manner. Not good, not okay, excellent. And then also having the distribution there to back up that excellence, to get it to the right people. And those things are really on the same platform. Otherwise, you're just, you know, it's not exponential growth, but it's more sustainable or, or small time growth. Where, you know, if you think about the baker on the corner, or if you think about how companies used to grow, they used to grow very linear, linearly. Um, but you, I think everyone here, should achieve to aspire to more, uh, to aspire to exponential growth. So I'll leave you with this. If you talk to anyone about what you're doing, you should talk about it if it's a unicorn, not the donkey that you are right now. You should talk about it as if you already achieved what you want to achieve, and then figure out later how is this donkey going to become that unicorn. Thanks so much for listening. I'll, I'll be happy to take any questions. Fabulous. Thank you very much. This is one of the biggest crowds I've seen. Oh, this great. Is, this is pretty good. I think, <laughs> they, I think they came for Antonio, but got you. I saw this one guy that was like, oh, right, I'm yeah, going to yeah. listen. So that's good. Um, I'm sure there must be a question or two. It's usually hardest to get the first one out, and then we get 10. So who's going to be brave enough? There's got to be one hiding in there somewhere. Anyone has the first question for me? How many of you guys have a, a company or a startup or a product already? There's one question. Yeah, yeah I see it. Who's got a product, startup? You know, growth. It's got to be on your mind. <laughs> if it isn't, you're doing something wrong. Uh, you know the rules. You've been around here enough. Uh, name and question. Uh, my name is Tresa. Uh, you started with the TQ uh, building. Can you tell them a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so TQ, what we've tried and, uh, and do there is really make a space so that 150 startups can uh, together be in that space as residents. Uh, we select those startups, but they pay us uh, uh, rent, even though it's a little lower than, uh, than most commercial buildings, you still pay rent. And then uh, in the top floor, uh, it's a community space that is open for events, for anyone outside the building to meet these companies and to learn from these companies as well. Uh, once we'll open, it'll be uh, uh, 6,000 square meters of uh, what is essentially uh, a tech hub. And we're doing that together with uh, the Next Web, who founded the building, uh, Google, ABN Omro, KPMG, and uh, Booking.com. So it'll also be a space where these kind of partners will put their network in. And if a product manager from Google comes by and, a, and he or she works on maps, uh, then we're the place where they will talk about that and where they will connect with companies and entrepreneurs and talent in the building. Um, and we're hoping to open somewhere in, in September. So yeah, please, please come by, all of you.
and, and did you say Google in that list of names? Yeah. Of course, they have a lot of experience with these buildings. They have Google campuses um, Absolutely. pretty much all over, all over Europe yeah, now. Yeah, we're, so. we're part of the Google for Entrepreneurs Network, yep. which means that if you're in the building, you can also go to Berlin for free and stay at the factory. You can go to Chicago. You can go to Minneapolis, to Coco, stay there for free. Yep. So, yeah, that's great. All great benefits. Uh, another question, perhaps? Yeah, hi. Uh, you showed us an, an, uh, a quote about strong opinions. Yeah. If you have those members in your team. What do you do if they don't uh, leave them? Uh, I, I did have that situation a few times where someone was so adamant on their solution and we had disproven it time and time again that it wasn't the case and we had even launched something and that was successful because we didn't do what they thought was right. Yeah, I had to take them aside and say, listen, you know, I, I understand the passion, but you, you, need to, you, know, you need to get off your high horse and see what is actually happening. And I think that's um, a certain mindset that some people might never really uh, get and that's unfortunate like i've seen people leave teams because they were not able to accept reality because they were not able to accept that their opinions were just opinions um i personally wouldn't waste my time with someone that isn't on that on that flexible stance uh, but that being said I, I think there are ways that you could say to someone using that example hey it's it's fine i have a strong opinion but you need to be you know you need to not hold it that close to your chest you need to let let it go? Is that? Yeah, I guess that's the quote. Yeah, I mean <laughs> y you got to listen to the data, right? Uh, yeah. Of course, on the flip side, if you're the leader of a company, those passionate people, if you can encourage them to be a little bit more open and flexible, they can be dynamite for you, right? Because, you know, when you do find the right thing and they're passionate about it, they'll just keep going and going and yeah, going. Absolutely. So it depends which side of the coin you're coming from. Yeah, I'm definitely not saying that passion is bad. It's really, really good. It just needs to be you know, flexible. It needs to be uh, reality driven. I was going to say, with a little dose of reality, not too much, just yeah. a little bit. <laughs> Another question from the audience. Maybe, uh, here, see what I told you, right? All right. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mark. Um, do you have any experience with uh, crowdfunding? And uh, if so, uh, can you tell a little about it? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, with Karma, uh, which was a hardware product, we really, really thought about doing crowdfunding because hardware products seem to be more tangible for people to invest in from a crowdfunding perspective. So, you know, at that point we were discussing with Indiegogo and with Kickstarter, like, should we launch on these platforms? The reasons we didn't do it is because I think people are not really, on a, on a larger scale, used yet to crowdfunding in such a way that they are able to detach themselves from the result. So crowdfunding is, you know, Kickstarter says it, they're not a store. They are an investment platform where you believe in an idea and we're going to make it happen. And luckily, Kickstarter and all these platforms uh, over the course of uh, the last three, five years have gone better, have, have been you know, improving in how they pitch this to their customers and pitch this to their users. Like, hey, you know, the fact that you want this umbrella with, uh, you know, that's a smart umbrella with a smart app and whatever, uh, that might not mean that it actually gets built. And so we were able to, inf instead of that, create our own community and really kind of manage those expectations. We made a lot of mistakes with Karma as well in terms of, uh, of managing expectations, of managing deadlines and how we worked with manufacturers. But the reason that we really didn't have confidence ourselves yet on when this product would ship, when we would get our hardware partners to deliver on their promises, that made us doubt if we could uh, convince others of that as well. And so we were just in this phase where we were starting out and we had no hardware experience if we were a little bit more confident, if we had worked with our manufacturers for years and years and years, and if we had done hardware before, I think crowdfunding would have been the right way. You just have to manage those expectations really well because they can blow up in your face anytime. And I, and I would think I would add to that, I assume you're thinking about doing something with crowdfunding. The hardest work is in the three months before you launch the campaign because you can't just hit that button and say, okay, everybody, now's the chance. The clock is ticking, and, and if you don't get that momentum really quick, like the first, what is it, week, week and a half? Yeah. If you're not at like 40, 50, 60% in two weeks, that's it. You're not going to meet the end. So you got to spend so much time at, in advance, prepare your community, prepare your network, know who your users are, know, right? Get help. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of work. Exactly. we got time for one last question. Yes, sir, you've been waiting patiently. I'll come around behind you. It's easier. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi, um, I have one last question. I want to know who's your role model. So who is your biggest inspiration? Because I think everybody have a role model when they started. Me also. So who is your imp inspiration? And in, uh, I'm um, yeah. 
I'm going to answer that question a little bit differently because I think uh, people are oftentimes too focused on the Elon Musk and the Steve Jobs and stuff like that. Like, I think you should have inspiration uh, uh, from your friends. Try and figure out who is, you know, the person I want to be, who is the person that pushes me, and then use them as your role model. So I have, like, you know, I have a friend, uh, Boris from The Next Web, for instance, who is, who is really great. He can walk into a room, he can tell a story, and within five minutes, like, ten people around him are listening to the story and laughing about this story. I can't do that yet. And, you know, he has that gift. And that is, that is kind of like, you know, that's where I get my role models from, is from, those, from your circle of friends. You shouldn't be, I, I don't know, I'd like, I, I don't like to uh, stare at like someone like Elon Musk, who obviously I respect and like I, I, I want to achieve to be, but there's also a certain element to it where I'm like, I maybe should uh, think about the role models close to me and the th people that really can push me and can call me on my bullshit and like, you know, can really uh, push me forward. And that or that's not Elon Musk. I don't know him that well, you know. <laughs> it's more the people next to you and the friends that you look up to and say, Ah, damn it! Like he did this thing. If I wanted to do that as well, like, or you know, this this guy is like doing this, and I have so much respect for it. Maybe I have a more con a bigger connection with that someone, and I can actually learn from each other. We can push each other. I think that's that's the role model sh you should be looking for attainable role models. I think that's the difference between a role model and a hero, right? Some a hero, somebody who you can't quite True. get to, you yeah. can't quite reach, but wow, they're doing awesome stuff. And yeah. I maybe I'm a little bit envious, and I wish I could be like them. But the role model is someone like, yo, I, wow, that I, I could be like that. I've just got to figure out how. And by the way, Robert, yeah. you, you know, you, you made the comment about walking into a room, telling a story, and not drawing a crowd. I think you've done a pretty <laughs> good job. If you Fair guys enough. look behind you, there's a whole row standing as well. So, um, you saw it with Oscar, so you know how it happens. A tent, it's yeah. not a campus party. I'm actually experience. going camping pretty soon. So, uh, well, now you got a spare tent yeah, to take with you, great. just in case. All right. Uh, thank you so much. It was good to see you again. Welcome back to Amsterdam. We should talk about buildings because uh, there's a lot of synergies between Let's do that. us. Yeah. Uh, 100 kilometers or two, that's fine, no problem. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, campus party, round of applause, Mr. Robert Gaal. Thanks, everyone.